What's up, y'all? I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut, and this is episode 12 of Lawns Across America. Well, welcome back, y'all. This is episode 12. Can you believe this? Episode 12 of Lawns Across America. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget, if you find this podcast useful, you have other friends that have just bought a house or have a lawn or care about a lawn or want to know how to feed a lawn or just want to know how to have a good lawn for their next Instagram photo, please share this podcast with them on whatever, you know, you're on iTunes or Google Play or if you're on YouTube, we also have it on YouTube. You can obviously obviously just Google search Lawns Across America, but I really appreciate that if you guys would share it because as you know, here at Lawns Across America, I don't just teach lawn care, I preach it. And somebody actually last week said, made a really nice comment. I I didn't catch their name, but uh, that person knows who they are. They said that this is the greatest lawn care theory channel. And I think they said greatest lawn care theory channel or something like that on YouTube. But what I took from that is that's kind of cool, lawn care theory. (laughs) I kind of like that. That kind of reminds me of something that Matt Martin might say, like that he does lawn care theory. So that's kind of cool. And I do try to give you that. I try to get you to think about things a little bit differently, look at them from a different angle, because I think looking at things from a different angle or changing levels can always help you to make better decisions going forward. I also talk a lot about trusting your gut. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. We've got a lot to go through. We're going to talk about problem grasses that I'm seeing a lot of popping up. We're going to talk about spring grub worms and pre-emergence as we always do. And I'm sure we'll unpack another couple cool things as we move along. But before we did that, I wanted to open up today and get you guys to kind of think about something. Now that the good majority of you that I'm talking to here are out and mowing, a good majority of you, in fact, I would say most of you, most of you, your lawns are also starting to green up. It's really funny how when you look across the country, even though Georgia wakes up a lot quicker weather-wise than, say, northern Illinois, let's say Rockford, Illinois, they wake up at a really different time, but the grass types per pretty much green up about the same time. Like right now, if you go to Georgia and you look at a Bermuda lawn, it is just starting to green. People with Bermuda lawns are kind of like, ah, yeah. And and then some might be a little further than others, but like I said, it's not like they've been green for months now, even though the weather's been turned for a couple of months now. The lawns haven't. And if you go to Rockford, Illinois, same thing. Those Kentucky bluegrass fescue lawns in Rockford, Illinois, are just starting to come into their own now too. Together, completely different parts of the country, hundreds of miles apart, different grass types, but they're both coming into their green. And as you guys know, I'll always say Kentucky Derby Day, first Saturday in May, Kentucky Derby Day is always the peak. It's just like this thing that I've just noticed over the years. It's always the peak of green. And so I always enjoy the Kentucky Derby because I like seeing the grass runs that they do also on that day. But what I wanted to say is now we are into that green is I want to just tell all of you to go out and remeasure your lawn. Even if you just measured it last year, or as some of you that listen to you this, your measurement of your lawn, your property map may have been made years ago, five, six, seven, eight years ago. I remember when I lived in Northwest Indiana, this is how it was for me. I had measured my lawn when I first moved in, actually while I was doing my seeding. I seeded that on bare ground, and that's when I did my original measurement. And like five years later, six years later, I was like, man, I should probably remeasure this because I had put in flower beds and landscaping that I had forgotten about, or you don't realize, you think, oh, that bed's not that big. It's only a 150, 200 square foot bed, but you put in a few of those over successive years that can take square footage out. Maybe uh, you have to redo your mailbox, and so you expand the flower bed around your mailbox, and you don't realize that. Maybe the mulch rings around your trees get bigger in certain areas. This happens over time, and it's a good idea to remeasure and just double check your math. It's also a good idea just to rewalk it with that eye. You know, I talk about changing levels and looking at things from a different perspective. Well, go back to when you first started again and get out that tape measure and sling that thing across the lawn and walk it out and use a brick to mark where it ends because you only have a 25-foot tape measure, but you got 200 feet to measure, so you got to do this in and out. Go back and experience that again. Go back to that original starting place. I think that'd be good for you. And it will help you to just walk the areas again, again, in a different perspective from that beginner's perspective. It's never a bad idea to revisit the basics. So I would encourage all of you this weekend, get another excuse to get out. Maybe you're going to do some weeknight lawn work tonight, and that can be your weeknight lawn work. Get out, pull a few weeds, you know, maybe burn a few weeds in the cracks like we like to do with our propane torches and uh, remeasure your lawn. Have a little cigar while you do it. I think that's something that's really good to revisit. Speaking of that, I had another concept I thought about I wanted to share with you guys that I think some of you will get a kick out of. When it comes to lawn measuring, I noticed that 
there are these kind of stair steps of the size of the lawn. And guys, I don't know if I can see this through the way they write or through the swagger that they carry and the gifts that they use in Facebook, but there's guys that have lawns that, that run with a little more swagger. And sometimes it isn't just the way the lawn looks, it's the size of the lawn. Now, guys, we like to kind of use size as a measuring device anyway, but I'm more talking like I can compare it to how I know that my wife feels about diamonds, or I'm assuming a lot of women feel about diamonds, right? There's that one carat cutoff point. At least this is how my wife's taught me. Now, I'm not being sexist here or anything like that. This is what my wife has taught me, and I love her and want to honor her wishes, and she told me when we first got married that one carat was kind of that, that was like that goal where she felt like that's good. And I know it's all about measuring up. And good thing she doesn't listen to this podcast because she probably wouldn't like me sharing this. But I think a lot of you guys are putting up, picking up what I'm putting down here is that that one carat feels good. But what is it with lawns? What's the cutoff? Like, I feel like 5,000 square feet with lawns is the, is like the normal size. I feel like that's the nominal size. Maybe that's like the, the one third carat where it's like, hey, just as an average across the world or across the United States, like one third carat, that's just a good representation of a nice diamond and I love you, baby. And then, of course, you have the the clarity of the diamond, and then you also have the inclusions in the diamond. So not only is it the size, but it's the quality. And a, and a lawn can be that way, too. A 2,500-square-foot postage stamp lawn, actually a 1,500, 1,000-square-foot 1, lawn, postage stamp lawn in Chicago on the south side that's got super tight edging and really clean sidewalks around it, and it's that perfect square. Um, that lawn right there, because it's a quality lawn, it's it's got no inclusions, and it's got super green clarity. If it's only a 1,000 square feet, it's really small. That can look more striking than the full acre lawn that is just full of weeds and dirt and, and everything else. Man, there's a lot of things that overlap here. So hopefully I haven't buried myself, and uh, I'm not going to get all kinds of uh, backlash on Twitter for this. I think you guys will get it. So what is that size? I think it's 10,000. I think... 5,000 is the normal, and I think if a guy arrives at over 10,000, I think that might be where he kind of sits back and goes, yeah, man. And as I've also learned with the one carat standard being the the I feel like I'm there kind of deal, it's actually got to be a 1.1 carat, and it can't be a 0.99. So you have those kind of extra points over the carat that say, no, 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 I'm not just the one carat. I'm not just 10,000. I'm 10,000. 250 square feet. Now, I will admit to you guys that since a lot of the changes I've done here with my landscaping, that's why I brought this up, because for those of you that follow the channel, you know that when I moved in, I've expanded my landscape beds and added some, as well as mulch rings, but in the back, I've lost some square footage as well, because our pool was just like in the middle of the sunlight, like in the, like literally our pool was in our neighbor's back windows. It was like they were watching TV through their windows to watch us in the pool, which they probably didn't see anything that they would want to see anyway, and that's why we put up trees. <laughs> we put up a lot of palms to kind of, so they wouldn't have to see that. Um, I'll talk about my neighbor Mike here in a minute, but with that, I think that I needed to remeasure, and I did, and I actually found out that I've come up now. I'm actually like at 8,500 square feet, so I've actually gone backwards. I don't know if that's indicative, indicative of where my marriage is or whatever, but maybe after this podcast it might be, but there's a lot of concepts there for you guys to unpack, and I hope that you'll find that is funny. Now, speaking of that, I did actually go to a marriage conference this weekend with my wife, <laughs> ironically enough, uh, with our church, and it was a lot of fun. It was in downtown St. Pete. We had a great time. But before I left, I applied a full application of Sunnyland All Natural. It's Sunnyland is a local Florida company here. They're uh, one of my favorite companies because they're a Florida company. They've been around for a long time. Lee Moore is a friend of mine. He is the owner there, or he's family and one of the owners in that. And, he, and as far as I know, he runs it. <laughs> Maybe Billy over there runs it. But either way, they're a great local company, and they have their own Melorganite clone. And it's funny because it's a real true Melorganite clone in that Lee took the bag and made it look really similar to the Milo. I mean, I think he put a citrus tree on there and some sort of mock palm tree on there to make it look a little Florida. But other than that, maybe a different breed of dog. <laughs> on there. But other than that, Lee made it a real close clone. The thing about it is, is though, is his smells like success at another level. If Milo smells like blueberries and, you know, maybe slightly rotting corpses, I would say that Sunnyland smells like 
a wild pig. We have a lot of wild pigs here in Florida. I feel like a wild pig may have died in the middle of the street. That's what I feel like it, it is. It's, my wife says it smells like a locker room full of sweating men. And that's because another reason she might be mad at me is because after I applied that Sunnyland application, you guys can see if you look at my most recent video, which is a video where I visited, revisited basics, it's called Strategies for Beginners or Lawn Care Tips for Beginners. It's on the YouTube channel, The Lawn Care Nut. You'll see in there that I applied some of that Sunnyland and I applied a full app, like a full 12 pounds per thousand. It's a 640, so 12 times 6% brings 0.72 pounds of nitrogen per thousand, which is about three quarter pound. It's a 30 pound bag. We did some math in there. I mean, you guys know when I do basics videos, they get a little bit more involved and I explained why that was in the video, but I put that down. I applied it and we left. But before we left, I knew that my wife was going to comment on it because every time I apply Malorganite, and this was the first time I really applied Sunnyland real heavy, and I knew it was going to bring a reaction. I just knew it. So I was recording her voice as she came out, and as soon as she stepped into the garage, she was like, oh, no, you applied that stuff, didn't you? Now, she doesn't know if it was the Sunnyland clone or Malorganite or what it was, but she knew it, and I said, yeah, baby, I did. I said, tell me how, it's, how it smells, and that's when she said it smelled like what she imagined an old sweaty locker room would smell like. So I guess I can get some of that in there too, but it is definitely rotten flesh is what that smells like. So it's super success, but what's more funny about that is we went away for the marriage retreat, and when we came back on Sunday afternoon, my neighbor Mike comes over, and my neighbor Mike is awesome. He's, he's just one of the coolest dudes I know, super down-to-earth guy. He comes over, he goes, man, he goes... He goes, just like you, man, you throw that stuff down. And I'm kind of imitating him. He goes, man, that's how he talks. Man, you throw that stuff down. You go away for a romantic weekend and you come back. He goes, and I got to explain what's going on here all weekend. He's laughing, you know, because he, he thinks it's funny. He knows what the YouTube channel is. They know what I do. They are super cool. They support it that way. They have to. If you live next to me, you got to be supportive. And thanks to them, him and his wife and family. They're awesome people. But what I'm getting at is, is he felt like, I guess he told me that the smell was so bad. Now, we live in a neighborhood of walkers. People walk here. We walk in our neighborhood and ride bikes and all that. And as people would walk by right there on the sidewalk, he would see their reaction. They would smell this, this fertilizer. And so he sits out there on his front porch, and it's well known. And he doesn't want people to think that the smell's coming from him. So he'll go, oh, that's Alan. You know, he uses that organic fertilizer. Because I guess some people would even think maybe there was a problem with the pipes, at my house. That's how pungent this fertilizer, this Sunnyland is. And so he would he would explain that. And what's he also or what I also noticed is that he said is that people would almost not be offended by it, but they would be like, you know, commenting on the smell hard, like definitely, you know, making gestures and he would hear people talk about it. And he would go, Well, you know Alan, you know, he's got that organic out there. And when he would say that, people would go, Oh, okay, well, that's okay. So in other words, because it's organic, it's okay that it smells like success. And I think that's really awesome that people understand that, hey, it's okay to have the smell of success because it's not the pain that you feel now in your nostrils, it's the success to come. And to put up with a little bit of smell right now, a little bit of scent, a little bit of pungence to let you know what's going on there, it's okay to put up with that now because you know that the success is right down the road. It's not that far away. So I figured I would share that one with you. And I hope that that helps you think a little bit. I also hope that this opening monologue this week hasn't offended too many people. If it has, I promise I will walk it back next week the best I can. Maybe I'll be able to fix it and edit. We'll see. Next general question. So this is one where a lot of you guys across the Midwest, first of all, those of you that were affected by heavy storms, I know there was some pretty hardcore stuff through Louisiana and stuff. Hope you guys are cool. Hope you guys are good. I know that you get a lot of these kind of storms in the spring. But this is the first one, and it can tend to catch people, you know, in a, in a way that they're not ready for. So I hope you guys are all cool there. But one thing that came with that was a lot of rain, I know. And then even up through the Midwest, a lot of you guys got hit with some snow. Even Jake the Lawn Kid, and I saw a couple other people commenting that they got snow, like a couple inches of snow. And this was like mid-April, what, the 12th, 13th, something like that. That is a little bit late, especially for Northwest Indiana. I wouldn't say that we would get snow that would stick typically in April, mid-April like that. So that's a little late from what I can remember. But either way, what a lot of folks are asking, and especially further north where you may have got four, six, or even seven or eight inches, I think a few of you got further north is, hey, Alan, I put my pre-emergent down. I waited. I did what you said. Soil temps were approaching 55. Forsythia might have even been blooming or close, you know, what this and that. 
and then I got this snow up here, what is that going to do to my pre-emergent? Is that going to hurt me? Well, let me just tell you that if you got enough snow where snow plows had to drive across and scrape up your parkway again, maybe you had to snow blow giant piles, maybe uh, people had to walk on the lawn to shovel it or whatever. If you had to do that, then yeah, that's going to affect the pre-emergent barrier. And there's nothing you can do about that. That's why we do split applications. I talk about that second coat of paint. That's why we do three pounds per thousand in the first app and three pounds per thousand in the second, which comes roughly 40 days later or as soil temperatures are approaching 70. So you should be fine. Let that, that snow melt off. Some spots may have been disturbed. You got that second app coming up. Now, if you want to move that second app up, you want to move it sooner because you're, you're feeling like some disturbances happened, go ahead. No problem. Shake it down, get it down, throw her down, water it in. You're only going to be... In most cases, uh, you know, 25, 30 days early anyway, you're good. You're going you're gonna to be covered up through. I feel good about right now where we're at in mid-April. If you get three months of that, April to May to June, you'll, you're fine. I think you're going to be okay. So maybe you want to move it up just a little bit. No problem there. Now, if you just got that three, four inches that just kind of hits and dissipates, maybe it sat overnight, and then the next morning as the sun came out, it went off, I will tell you that the way you want to look at snow like that is it is just it's severely slowed down cold rain. That's what that kind of snow is. That two to three to four inches that might stick for a few hours is severely slowed down cold rain. That's all it is. It's just going to water your pre-emergent in. Or if you had already put it down and had already been watered in, it's just going to move through like like warm fast rain would. And that brings us to the other side where people did get warm fast rain. Again, if you're a little bit further south, some of you got a ton of rain just pounding on you that just started hitting you, and you're wondering, Alan, Alan, what about that heavy rain I got? Is that heavy rain going to hurt my pre-emergent? So this is where we have to just kind of talk logically. How do you really define heavy rain? How do you define that? It's really hard, isn't it? It's difficult because did all that rain come down? You know, let's say you got six inches of rain. Well, that's a lot. Six inches of rain. Well, if all that six inches came down in one hour, that's a different kind of heavy rain than if that six inches came down over four days. But I can call both of those heavy rain. The other thing is, is what a, there are other factors that add to that heavy rain. What about all the stuff that comes off of your rooftop? Maybe your downspouts aren't directed properly, and you get a pool on one side of your lawn. That's nothing to do with the rain. That's actually something with your area there and the way your drainage works. So that can affect things. So if you're asking me, did the heavy rain affect the prodiamine? I don't know about those types of things where you have those site-specific challenges that you're dealing with that heavy rain may affect. Those are other things I don't know about. So what I would tell you is, is first of all, let's just trust the science, okay? These products are used by professionals. They are in products that you can get at the store. They are used and have been used in the case of prodiamine, I think since 1987 or so was when the patent for, for, it, when it, for the brand name came out, which I can't, Barricade. So I think that's when it is. But either way, it's been used for years. Let's trust the science and the science that was used in the university studies that were done leading up to that to bring that to market. And then secondly, let's trust that the professionals have been using it for years. It's the gold standard per diamine is. They still use it. They've been putting applications down previous. And then other than that, let's just trust and hope for the best. You know, that's what we have to do. We have to still follow the label. And the label doesn't say if you get a heavy rain, you could reapply. What the label says is maximum this much per year. And if you're on cool season lawns, you get six pounds of the 0.38% per thousand square feet per year. That's all you get. If you've already applied three, just because you think you got a heavy rain, you can't think you made up for that because you don't know. So that's why we do the split app. You put your second app down, just like the guys with the heavy snow. You can move up your second app a little closer if you need to. Now, if both your apps went down already, then again, that's where we have to trust the science, trust that you made a good application, trust that the product works. And if anything does break through, then that's just how the season is. No season is going to be perfect. You're never going to have a perfect season ever. If this one just happens to be a heavier rain season, I'm using air quotes there because every year somebody's going to tell you that it's a heavy rain season. Every year you could find somebody everywhere that forgets how heavy the rain is every spring and will tell you that this is a heavy rain season every year. And then you'll get somebody else that comes back and says, no, no, it's not heavy compared to the 1974 that I remember. You know, you're always going to have that. And it goes back to perspectives. So what I would tell you is to trust the process, trust that you put your applications down properly, that you did what you could. You controlled the controllables, which is the timing of the soil temps. That's in your control. You measured out your product. That's in your control. You did a proper application with proper overlap. That's in your control. Control the things that you can control and let everything else get sorted out by God or Mother Nature, whichever you choose. That's how we got to kind of roll with this, and that's going to lead us into a lot of the things that we're talking about today. 
Okay, so our first one, we're going to go right down into the middle of the country. This is Christopher, and he's in St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, Alan, I'm a huge fan, love all the videos in the podcast. The videos are packed with useful information and are enjoyable to watch. I also follow you on Facebook, and I want to learn as much as I can. That's great, and Christopher, thank you, because that's why I put out content on all these different channels, because every channel can answer something in a little bit different way, sometimes visual, sometimes audio, sometimes sight and sound. So thank you. Follow on all those different places. Just Google search the Lawn Care Nut. You'll find me. Good job. I love to enjoy the mow. My grandfather had me riding on his mower with him cutting grass when I was two. Mowing is like therapy, and I find it relaxing. Yes, exactly right, bro. That's what enjoy the mow is. I watched both the videos on the 2018 Toro Super Recycler and your review of the Honda HRX 217. I know you said you'd do a video review comparing the two, but just curious, if you had to buy one mower and a 21-inch cut, which would you choose? All right, Christopher, this is a great question. So, Here's what I will tell you when it comes to those mowers. And I did just view the Toro Super Recycler. If you guys go to the channel, The Lawn Care Nut, you'll find it there. And I am going to compare that to the HRX coming up here very soon, maybe sooner rather than later. But I will tell you that you want to make sure that you enjoy the mow first and foremost. That's the most important thing. And so when you talk about borrowing one, what I would recommend you do is go to your local dealer that has Toro and see if they will let you rent a Toro Super Recycler or use one at their place, something. See if they have a used one that they'll let you check out. I would recommend you do that. Same with the Honda HRX. I'm sure you could find a friend that maybe has one. I'm not sure if they have any kind of way that you can go out and demo one, but definitely go and put your hands on it if you can. Because what you're going to find is is that the self-propelled part of those mowers is very different. And I'm also going to tell you, all of you guys, I recommend that no matter what you do, when you invest in your mower, your first mower, that you definitely get a self-propelled mower. I prefer real-wheel drive. I just like the way it drives better. When you have front-wheel drive, the front wheels tend to come off of the ground a lot, and it can affect the the uh, propulsion as well as around when you're making turns. Rear, rear wheel drive will do a little bit better for you. But I recommend you spend the extra money and get a self-propelled mower. The reason that is is because if you get a self-propelled mower, immediately you're going to enjoy the mow more because you're not having to work hard. You still get exercise. You still walk. You can still get exercise out of it by adjusting it where the self-propulsion is more of an assist rather than a drive. You can definitely do that with all of these models. But either way, make sure you have some sort of power assist with it so you will enjoy the mow because the more you enjoy the mow, the more you will mow. And that is what I keep trying to tell you guys. Most of the problems, most of the challenges that you face throughout the year are due to the fact that you're not mowing enough. I promise you that. The more you mow, the healthier it will grow. So that's the first thing I'd say you do, Chris, is look at the self-propulsion. You're going to find that the Toro has that personal pace, which is what I call more of a leisure drive. It's more of a leisurely mow because it is personal pace. It kind of just moves along with you, and it's actually very fluid. It's actually pretty stable, and I like the way that works, and I always have. Before that, it was Lawn Boy, and I can't remember what Lawn Boy called theirs, but they had a version of it. Lawn Boy and Toro are own, you know, it's the same company, so I'm not sure if they all related back, but that's what I prefer is that personal pace kind of move. Now, if you get the Honda, I call that more active. Now, the one I have, and I think they have different uh, drive systems, but the one I have, the HRX 217, has this paddle kind of thing. It looks like a spaceship on there and you paddle it with your thumbs. You push it, you actuate it with your thumbs and there's a dial on there to make it more assist or more more hardware. It'll pull you and this and that, but that's more active because I'm pushing my thumbs forward to make that work and I'm moving forward at the same time, which automatically makes it active because I'm actuating the drive in a forward motion with my thumbs and I'm walking forward at the same time. Whereas the personal pace, it more weights on you just to walk. So you're only doing one motion, which is walk and your hands on the lever or on the handle are what make it go and that's not an extra movement because your hands are moving in that direction anyway. I hope that makes sense. It's something to do with that posable thumb. So with that Honda, that posable thumb pushing forward on that paddle makes it more active. Now you can make, and I learned this in my Toro Super Recycler review I just did, you could actually make that feel more active, that, that personal pace. I raised the handle up to the highest version or to the highest level. I'm pretty short. I'm 5'8". So that put the handle up really, I mean, at my chest, like right across my pectorals, you know, and that made the drive more active just because it was higher up, where in an unnatural position for my hands, high up there, whereas the way I had it adjusted in the middle had my hands in a more natural position, which is closer down by my waist. So just by raising the handle up, it did make the personal pace a more active feel. So there you go. I hope that helps you, Chris. That's what I would recommend you do is go out and look at it that way. They're both going to cut 
the same. They both cut awesome. They are both, as far as from my experience, two of the best mulching mowers on the market for homeowners. I have not found anything better, but I haven't used a lot of other things either, if I'm honest. So that's what I would say there. If you're going to ask, I am taking the Honda HRX217, and it is getting dedicated to the Zoysia Grow. I do like that it's got that two-blade system under there. I also like the way it mulches as it spits it out the back and this and that. And so I'm using the Honda over there. I also am going super low on my Zoysia, and I feel like this is my intuition, my gut. I feel like the Honda will do better at the low cut because it's got that two-blade system. Now, we'll test that out coming up, but I'm going to go ahead and dedicate for now the HRX to the low cut Zoysia, which is at two inches right now. I'm going to try to go down to one and a half coming up when I enjoy my mow tomorrow on my weeknight lawn work. In the front, we're going to use the Honda, or the, keep doing that. We're going to use the Toro Super Recycler on the front in the Palmetto where we're mowing at three, three and a quarter inches. So that's how that's going to roll this year. And I'll compare both back to back. But there you go, Chris. I'm sure that was a lot more information than you wanted. But the big thing is to get out there and make sure you're going to enjoy that mow. He's got one more question here. He says, I'm building my first home and every single dollar is going towards the down payment. Well, Chris, that is a smart move, my friend. Super smart. Congratulations on your first home, my friend. And you're building it for your first home, which is awesome. He says, I'm going to have a very small yard, so a 21-inch mower is all we need. The builder is going to put in turf-type tall fescue sod. It's being built in Imperial, Missouri, which is about 30 minutes south of St. Louis. All right, cool. So it's a small lawn, and it's getting turf-type tall fescue sod put down by the builder. He says, I was curious, if you were going to lay sod, what steps would you take? I want to do everything I can to make sure my lawn dominates the neighborhood. Okay, so this is controversial, and that's good. I want to bring this up. I think I might offend people with this one, but this is my feeling, and this is from my years of observing sodded lawns in northwest Indiana, which were sodded on the ugliest, plainest gray clay you could ever imagine. I know that people down in Georgia like to talk about their Georgia red clay or their orange clay, but let me tell you something. There is nothing more dead than colorless gray clay. It is the deadest of dead clays, and that is what we had up there. And I'm sure there's a technical name for it, slough clay, or I don't know. There's some name. But anyway, that's the clay we had. And let me tell you something. When it was wet, it was like you were playing with that old Play-Doh stuff. That's how, and it would stick to you. It would stick to your everything. It was nasty. It was like glue almost. And then when it was dry, it was hard as a rock, and it would crack like crumbling bricks. That's what we had, okay? And I worked for True Green during the years, and it's not just Northwest Indiana, it's all of Illinois, south of Chicago there, all of that area growing. I'm talking all the new growth that went through Tenley Park, Orland Park, Frankfurt, Mokina. People that are from the south side know that the boom in those areas, how that was. Now, we had some boom in other areas too, like Country Club Hills and Hazel Crest and some areas like that, even South Holland, but those areas were more established, so those were more a lot of rebuilds and things like that, and there had been a lot of uh, homes and neighborhoods existing around them. But if when you went out to Frankfurt, Mokina, even Orland, Tinley, those were all former farm fields that were growing in this gross, nasty, colorless, gray clay. And I will tell you that I worked on those lawns for years, and there were many of them that were only just treated with Scott's four-step, but they were watered properly from the jump, and they were cut properly. And they were a lot of our customers as well. But the biggest thing was they were watered properly, and they were mowed properly. And those lawns were put on just that flat clay, and that was it. And in most cases, they weren't even given what I call a finish grade. It was just a final grade, which a final grade, I am not an excavator. I am not somebody that is an expert in this, so I'm just going to tell you what I know, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell you in general terms, a final grade is designed to just make sure that you have proper drainage to your swales and proper drainage around your home. That's what a final grade is for. It is not a perfect grade for sod. It's a final grade, not a finished grade. And typically, in order to get, at least from what I know, because I had a house built in Northwest Indiana too, in order to get a certificate of occupancy on the new home so you can move in, you just had to have an approved final grade. And then, for us, you did have to have some sort of grass for erosion control. If you had put seed down in my subdivision, if you had put seed down, they would have been okay with that. But most subdivisions required that not only did you have to have the final grade, but you also had to then have some sort of erosion control down. So what they would do is they would sod the front and then they would seed the back, sometimes hydro seed, but most times they would do seed with straw. 
and that was good enough to get you a certificate of occupancy. So I will tell you, now, in between that final grade, remember, no finish grade. A finish grade is basically where I would say they bring in a box blade, which is on the end of a bobcat, and they give you a nice finish grade, which is going to be a finer grind or a finer grade till, and it's also going to give you a much flatter surface. There's a difference in flat and level, and it's not going to be perfectly flat, but the idea is they're going to smooth out that grade. They're going to take out any giant ruts. They're going to take out any giant rocks for the most case. And then in a lot of cases, they will hand finish with rakes and pull the rocks out. That's a finish grade. But I will tell you that in a lot of cases, the builders never did the finish grade. What the builder would do is they would do the final grade, especially if it was in times when it wasn't winter. They would do a final grade and then someone would come in and sod right on top. That's it, nothing in between. And I saw thousands of lawns like that and those lawns were very healthy because they were watered properly deep and infrequent and they were also made sure that they were mowed properly. What I am telling you is, is that the key here was the mowing and the watering. It wasn't that they put six inches of topsoil in there. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to put topsoil in, but I want you to consider that when you bring topsoil in, what other problems are you bringing in? Do you know where that topsoil came from? If I saw builders that didn't go to the trouble to put a finish grade down, a finish grade on before sodding, and listen, guys, I'm not, I'm not criticizing builders. I'm not doing that. But if I, if I saw lawns that never had a finished grade, they just had a final grade and then sod plopped on top with no topsoil, and I will 100% tell you I have seen that in thousands of cases, and the back lawns were just seeded with, with sod, or uh, just seeded and then straw thrown over top, and those things end up cracked as cracked can be the next year. There's no care in that. It's minimum viable to get your certificate of occupancy, Okay. But those lawns came out fine. People that dealt with them, that worked with them, that fertilized them properly, but mostly that mowed them and watered them properly. I know I keep saying that, but repetition is the key to learning. Those lawns came out just fine. Now, the ones that were seated in the back, yeah, those always had to have more remediation. But the sodded lawns in the front came out fine. So I will tell you that the most important thing to do is to make sure that a good finish grade is done and that all the, rake, all the large rocks are raked out and taken out. And then when you get your sod down, that you get it watered properly from the jump. And then after 30 days, that's when you can start fertilizing. And I recommend you use organic fertilizers because they're going to build soil carbon immediately. And of course, I got some other products I'd recommend you use. The RGS root growth stimulator, which is, all, which is going to give you the sea kelp, which is going to help you get faster, deeper roots into that beautiful finished grade. The clay is fine. You guys know I'm not criticizing clay. Clay is actually my favorite lawn soil because it's worthless, because it has no nutrient value in it, because it doesn't offer a lot, then I can be the one who builds it. I can be the one that creates it and makes it nice and optimize it and it adds carbon and, and adds the nitrogen that I need and the elements that I need. I can be the one to do that instead of having to deal with something that I that came already pre-made for me, already high here and already low there. I'd rather have something that got nothing in it. That's how I'd rather start. And I'd rather do that with just a nice, perfectly made finished grade. Use that RGS if you want. It's going to help you stimulate roots. Humic acid, fulvic acid, those are going to drive more carbon into the soil and then just take off and go from there. But I, I highly recommend that you make sure you get a good finish grade. I also believe that any topsoil that you bring in, I believe that that clay sheds it really quick. I don't think it stays very long because I just don't think those two, two types of, of, prod, of uh, soil are going to mix. I just don't. I definitely know that that happens here. Sand sheds everything here. And I'm going to assume that when you look at the same kind of thing, when you have this super hardcore, you know, organic rich topsoil, and then you have this super crusty, clay underneath that that topsoil isn't going to just automatically incorporate down in there. I believe that that's just going to sit on top there. Now, again, maybe you till it in, maybe you do this, maybe you do that. I just think that's a lot of extra that may not be needed. Now, don't take my word on it. If your builder says he wants to bring in six inches of topsoil and do other things, don't tell him no, because you have warranties and things like that that you don't want to avoid. This is, for most part, this is just me spouting off, you know, my particular opinions on things and based on my experiences. My experiences are not what everybody else's are. My experiences are mine and I can just give you my advice. That is the recommendation that I would give you in that particular case and always hope for the best. There you go. I hope that helped you. Our next one now is going to go all the way back up and we're going to go to Minnesota and this is Bill. I'm enjoying going through the 2019 updated cool season guide. Bringing in the target temps to establish a plan was a great idea. Thanks, bro. I have a question in regards to throwing down my first split app of pre-emergent once my temps in northern Minnesota reach 55. So northern Minnesota, he's got to be coming right up on that 55 
right now, would you recommend throwing down perdiamine on a new lawn that ha that was established late last fall? I see on the label it says for established turf. He says, I had opened up a new section of yard and I was able to get it seeded and the blades grew to about two inches in length before the first frost of 2018. I had treated the soil with RGS until the first frost along with a late application of Milo. The snow is melting away here and I can start to see large areas of this new grass and it's looking good. I think it's going to pop this year. I'm working on putting together my plan for 2019. Thanks for all you do. What do you think? Okay, Bill. So this is a really good question. So what Bill is asking is how do I know if my lawn is established. Now, this is a little bit different because this is a lawn that was seeded. It seems like it was seeded a little bit late in the fall here, grew a little bit, and he's wondering, hey, am I going to be good this spring? Well, Bill, the problem or the question or the challenge that you have doesn't really have anything to do with the Berdiamine this year. We want to talk about last year is did your lawn make it through the winter? Did it harden off enough, well enough, that it could survive the winter? And typically, if you had mowed twice, I would say yes, for sure. If you had mowed once, I would say probably. If you didn't mow at all, but you could have mowed, then I would still say probably. So that's where I would kind of go. But typically, two mowings is, for cool season lawns, two mowings is your kind of litmus test to know that, yes, I am established. Now, you are coming out of winter, so you're going to need to wait and see. Do I have signs of life coming out of winter? Did my grass even come through winter? You'll know that. And as you see, it is starting to green up. As you see, there are signs of life there. Then that should tell you that, yeah, it came through. Boom, I'm going to put my prodiamine down. Now, if you did get some die off from winter, chances are maybe some of it did. Maybe some percentage of it did die from winter. Then I would say go by that 30% rule. If you have 30% turf there that did come through winter that was established enough to make it through winter, go ahead with your prodiamine and start pushing it with FERT. Push it with that RGS you have. Use some Milo. Get out there and then start mowing every three days and let that stuff thicken up naturally from where it's at. So, so that's my answer there is, again, Bill, it's usually going to be two mowings. All right, this next one started coming in now, and it's about grub worms. A lot of you guys are out digging in your lawns now that spring is here and you're finding grub worms. And I typically am mostly seeing this up north, but I actually even found some grub worms in my lawn in February this year. And so your first instinct is when you dig up and you find grubs, and by the way, you're finding grubs right now, they are big. They are full grown. They look like giant little shrimp underneath the lawn. And so they're even scarier than if you found grubs last fall, which are smaller and not mature. But I want to tell you that the grubs in the spring are probably not the case because one of the things that I always notice when people send me pictures of grubs that they found, if they're not in a garden bed, if they're in the lawn, what you always notice is that the grass around the grubs that they found is green. And that's usually your first clue that you have a grub problem is your grass is brown. So we'll come back to that in a second, but let's just talk about the lifestyle of grubs. I call them grub worms. That's because that's a, a searched keyword on the internet. They're not actually worms. They're larvae. So they're just grubs. But grubs are the larvae of Japanese beetles. You know what Japanese beetles are? They're June bugs. You'll find them in your pool filter every single year in June. You, sometimes they'll come out a little early in May. Sometimes they might come out in June, But depending on the weather. But the one thing that you'll find is that those will swing around. They'll fly around. They'll eat your purple plum bushes. They'll, they'll eat on, what, sand cherries. I think they eat rose bushes too pretty hard. I found them on Rosa Sharon one year up north, just ravaging my Rosa Sharon. But you'll find these... Japanese beetles, masked Schaefer beetles, they're called June bugs. You'll find them in June and they buzz around and they lay eggs and they lay eggs in your lawn and they do that through June and into early July. Now, the thing about it is they'll typically lay those in well irrigated lawns. If you're a mama June bug and you're flying around and you want to drop off your larva, are you going to drop them off in the uncared for dormant brown lawn, summer dormant lawn, or are you going to drop them off in the lawn that the guy's got his stuff together and he's got a beautiful, beautiful green flat nursery there for you to raise your larva in or for your larva to fend for themselves? And of course, you're going to lay them in the well-watered lawn. The other thing is, is that the well-watered lawn, the green lawn is a sign that there's roots there for the grubs to eat because that's what they do. So all summer, they kind of mature under the ground a little bit. And then as they mature, they come up and they chew on grass roots. And they'll chew on the roots of the grass all during the summer and into the fall. You won't notice the damage if your lawn is struggling in summer because most lawns struggle in summer, even well-irrigated ones. So sometimes you don't notice what those brown spots really are. You think it's something else. But as the fall comes and, and everybody greens up and everything starts to green up, some areas don't come back and you'll see these dead patches and you'll be able to peel them up like carpet and you will literally find the grubs. They'll look like little shrimp underneath the lawn. Specifically and mostly, they'll be at the edges of the brown spots. That's where they'll be because they're working their way out, feeding, they're fattening up. And then once soil temperatures, going to be funny here, once soil temperatures start to dip below, you know, 55, they start to go down deep. That's a cue to them that winter is coming and they start to go down deep and they get down deep enough so that they can live over winter 
frozen in a beautiful time capsule underneath your ground all during the winter. And then as the year progresses, they'll come back up. And in spring, you're finding them now. They're coming back up for one last little munch here before they get to June again and they emerge as adult beetles and the process starts all over. That's the beautiful life cycle of the June bug, of the mass Schaefer beetle. And there's a bunch of other names for them. So when you look at it that way, the ones you're finding now are last year's grubs. So my first question to you would be, well, did you have grub damage last year? Were these areas dead? Because they're green now. So if you did have grubs there, they probably were not in high enough populations to cause you any long-term damage last year. So they're probably not a concern this year, especially in the spring when the grass is growing super vigorously anyway. If it outgrew them last year in the fall, it's probably going to outgrow them this year in the spring. And they're not going to do quite as much munching in the spring. The fall is really when they're ravenous. Right now is when they're just kind of chilling. Maybe they're bringing up a little extra bite here or there. But their main goal is to go to that next stage of life. And I'm not sure what the right word is there, but they're going to pupate or whatever they do and come out as a June bug. So my biggest thing for you would be to not be concerned about grub worms that you find here in the spring. Note it. Definitely note it, though. Make a note of it. Take some pictures. Put them on Instagram. Panic people on my Facebook group if you want. And definitely, if you go to local hardware stores, they will sell you some grub treatments. They'll probably sell you one of the long-term grub treatments, which isn't going to work on these anyway for the most part. You need a curative grub app. But either way, I don't want you to do anything in the spring unless you are having large dead patches, but I highly doubt that's the case. What I would say, though, is this is the key to you that you need to put down a pre a uh, preventative for grubs this year. And you're going to put that down prior to June. You're probably going to put that down in late May or early June and get it watered in. And there's a lot of different active ingredients you can use. You can go to the store and get the Scots. Now, I think the new Scots, I don't know what the active ingredient is. I think it's got a much longer shelf life when you water it in, or, or I think it lasts longer. In other words, you can put that one down in the spring and it'll give you prevention all the way to the end of summer. Make sure you read the label. But I use old school Merit. And uh, Merit needs to be put down um, sometime in you know, early June and watered in, and it's going to give you about three months of control. So that's imidacloprid is that active ingredient there. It's a neonicotinoid, and that's the one that I am used to using. But again, I think that might even be considered a little bit older chemistry now, but that's, you'll still find it in a lot of places, and it still works very well to prevent grub worms. So that's, if you find these grub worms or you find these grubs in your lawn here in the spring, that's a clue that you're probably going to have a problem next year because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In this case, the grub worm mama doesn't fly away far from where she was hatched, and she definitely likes to raise her babies back home in your lawn. Sounds like a country song. So I hope that was helpful to you on grub worms. Now, I want to talk to you guys about something that's been coming up a lot, and this is a uh, kind of thing on Poa Anoa, Pona Trivi, Poa Trivialis, Poa this, Poa that, goose grass, Dallas grass, all these other problem grasses, barnyard grass, foxtail. I don't know. I could sit here and name them all day long. Somebody even talked about Japanese stilt grass or something the other day, which I thought was, wasn't even something that happened in lawns. Or no, maybe it was rice grass. Rice grass. I found that in my weed book, and I saw somebody talking about that too. I will be the first to tell you that I cannot identify problem grasses in the lawn. I, the only one I can identify for sure shooting every time is crabgrass. And the reason why is because it's so telltale in its coloring and its growth habit and its time of year that it shows up. And because that's where all my experience is up north is with crabgrass is that's the one I know the most. All the other problem grasses, I cannot identify them, especially from one single picture on Facebook, which is what a lot of people are seeing, that's far back, maybe 20, 30 feet back, or even if it's in your hand, it's still 10 or feet back, and it's one flat, non, not a 3D picture. I can't look at the way it's rolled in the bud. I can't look at the root structure. I can't look at you know, how the leaves, uh, blades come off. I can't see any of the, the ligules and all of these different things that I'm not an expert on, okay, but that I can just read about and follow some different types of tools. So that's the thing. It's really hard to identify that. And then you have the poa anoa that everybody keeps talking about that a lot of people get that we can prevent for the most part. In a lot of cases, we'll talk about that come late summer and fall. Then you have poa trivialis, which is a whole nother thing, rough stalk bluegrass that is not an annual and it does come back, but it can die off in the summer and it's, and it's pale yellow in color and it... All, and I don't know a lot about Poa Trivialis. I don't. We just didn't seem to deal with that in the areas that I've lived, right? But I'm seeing this come in, and people are panicking because everybody's answer is different because nobody is identifying the grass properly. So you can see how this creates some panic in some people, creates some issues, and some people can get a little concerned about it. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys some advice when it comes to problem grasses. 
And the first one is not to panic, okay? You're going to live at your house for a long time. Chances are your yard's been established for a long time, or maybe it's brand new, but either way, you got a long road ahead of you. In my last podcast, I talked about the infinite game versus the finite game. We don't have to win every single war right now, but what we do need to do is get the best information we can. We need to stick to the plan. We need to control the controllables, and we need to trust the process. And so the first thing you do when you have problem grasses is you try to mow them out. That's a cultural practice, and it's the number one thing you should do. Without a doubt, almost every time that I see somebody posting pictures of some problem grass that they have, the lawn needs to be mowed. If you would just mow it, you might mow it out. So the first piece of advice I have for you is, when in doubt, mow it out. Now, during that time, while you are doing that mowing, while you are trying to mow it out, I recommend that you go on the internet and search these key terms right here. Identification key to grass, weeds, in turf. Search those words. Identification key to grass, weeds, in turf. And you're going to look for the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources website. It's UCIPM. Okay? University of California Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. It's got dark blue at the top. It says UCIPM. Their website, they have the identification key to grass, weeds, and turf. And it's got this little kind of if this, then that tool that it takes you through. If the leaves are rolled in the bud, click here. If the leaves are folded in the bud, click here. And they show you pictures of it. Because problem grasses all look so similar. You've got to get down really close. You've got to get down close to where the bud is, to where the ligula is, to where things are. And that's how you identify. And you click through this. And it will take you through, and then it'll ask you, is the ligule is a fringe of hairs, or is the ligule membranous? I mean, it's fun to read this. Is the ligule membranous, or is the ligule is a fringe of hairs? Really interesting artwork to look at, too. You'll learn a lot when you go through this. But at the end of it, it'll take you through all these things, and you will then identify the problem grass that you have. Now, in the meantime, you've been mowing, and in a lot of cases, you can mow it out. In other cases, they might tell you there is no cure for the problem. In a lot of cases, they might tell you that the pre-emergence will do it. In a lot of cases, they might tell you that post-emergence will do it. Now, that particular website, I don't think it's going to tell you what to spray on it, but it's going to at least help you get the ID. And that's the first thing you have to do because, as G.I. Joe says, knowing is half the battle. So once you have gone ahead and ID'd the problem, now you can look for what kind of control you want to take on that. And I still recommend, even if the mowing isn't working, that you try hand pulling. I highly recommend that you do that. I think a lot of times you guys see me in my videos and you see that I do a lot of weed control in my videos. And the reason I do that is because that's what people need to know about. But what you don't see is all during the week where I'm pulling weeds. But see, I don't need to teach somebody how to pull weeds. I can't do a video on how to pull weeds. Maybe I should. But the idea being is, is that's not something that I'm typically making videos on, but it doesn't mean that I'm not doing it. Now, you will notice if you watch my videos, I pull weeds in them quite a bit because I always hold the weed up in the camera and I go, look at those roots, John Perry. That's my way of giving a shout out to my friend and having a little fun with him. But it's also my way of showing you guys that I pull weeds. How many, how many videos do you watch of mine where I pull weed in that video? It's got to be at least 50% of them. And then the other uh, good amount of time, I'm using my weed torch, which is propane, and I'm burning the weeds in the cracks. I'm not using chemicals for that. So I don't want you to always reach for a chemical first. Once you identify what it is, maybe it's just going to take a little bit of good old-fashioned hand pulling. Maybe it's going to take a little bit of what I call chop and drop, which is what I do with some of the problem grasses that I have here, like torpedo grass, that no matter what you do, you could glyphosate it and it will come back the next day because it will crawl underneath your house from your neighbors and you will get more. So there is no way to kill it, even with a torch, even with anything. It just, you can't do it. So what do I do? I chop and drop. If I get an area that gets a real bad infestation of torpedo grass, I chop out, I go buy three or four squares of sod, I chop it all down to the ground, I get my torch out and torch it just because it feels good to torch it, and I let that cool off and I just drop sod, chop and drop. Now, that torpedo grass will come back, sometimes it'll come back within three months if we get a lot of rain, sometimes it may take six or eight, but I'm not using any chemical there, and I encourage you not to always reach for the chemical on the first try, sometimes try to mow it out. What you're going to find is that a lot of these issues that you have, they're actually not even issues. A lot of times they're not even problem grasses, and that's the next point that I want to make. I want you to think about just how nature is. Not everything in nature is exactly the same color. Sometimes maybe sections of your lawn might get a little growth spurt. Maybe they'll jump up a little higher than others for whatever reason. 
And that growth spurt means that the chlorophyll doesn't get in there as much. Maybe they get zapped with cold at night when something else doesn't, and it just kind of knocks the color out of a little section of your lawn. It just grows too fast. I mean, I remember back when I started getting gray hair, everybody wanted to tell me reasons why I had gray hair. Maybe it was too much stress, or maybe I had one lady tell me I probably had diabetes, and that's why I was getting gray hair, all kinds of things. But really, what if my hair just turns gray? What if that's just the color of my hair? What if it's just the natural order of things? But I can tell you when I would cut my hair, it wouldn't look quite as gray. And if you cut your lawn, it's not going to, those light spots a lot of times are not going to show up. I don't know if that's a very good analogy there. I probably need to work on that one a little more. But the key there is, is that not every spot is a problem. Sometimes spots are just that. They're just spots and they just go away. Sometimes not every living thing looks exactly like the Photoshop picture that we see on iStock photos. Sometimes even grass can look a little different. It can be different shades. But as long as you keep everything trimmed and working together and growing together, it will all get along and it will all even out. So sometimes there's no problem grass at all. It's just a little bit of a color variation. Now, the last thing I want to say is that sometimes these problems are temporary, and by mowing, you can help keep the seeds from dropping. Whenever there's big nature events, like we had a ton of hurricanes that swept right up through the middle of the country last year. I know that, I think it was Pete from GCI was telling me that he saw that he had uh, army worms come up into his territory way up in North Carolina. They don't get army worms, but the hurricanes blew them in. Well, I'm sure the hurricanes are blowing in seeds too and all kinds of other things. The other things hurricanes do is they actually do define heavy rain. If you want to ask me, Alan, can you define heavy rain? Yes, it's a hurricane. And in last year's case, I think there was two that swept up through there within a matter of, of several weeks or a couple months. That type of heavy rain can definitely bring stuff up from underneath that's been buried and gone forgotten for a long time. But those problems can be temporary. If you just mow them out, they may not establish. They were buried and gone and forgotten for a reason. They've reared their ugly heads. Let's not let them catch a foothold. Let's not let them get sunlight. Let's mow our faces off and mow their faces off so that they'll go back to where they came from, back down to the depths, way down deep. And hopefully we won't get any more hurricanes. And the last thing I want to say, this is also why with these problem grasses that we talk about, I've already talked about earlier in the podcast how I don't like bringing in topsoil. I just don't know where it came from. That is not a knock on topsoil suppliers, but I'm just saying I don't know where it came from. The second reason or or the second thing to think about is these burn downs. When you burn your lawn down, you're exposing it abnormally. A lawn is not meant to be completely bare. And when you hit everything with glyphosate, you are burning it down bare. Now, I understand there are times when you have to do that. I did it at my St. Pete house because I had a literal 100% salad bar. There was absolutely not one stitch of good grass there. So I had to burn it down. But a lot of you guys, you know, you're just like, oh, I don't like my old school lawn or I do. I want to change from fescue to, to rye or whatever. I get it, and I and trust me, I do. I do. I understand why you do that. It's fun, and I don't want to sound like I'm annoyed at you because that's not the case. Sometimes I just want to be passionate about making a, a, a particular point to you, and that, it, and, I, and again, I don't want to squelch your fun, but I will say that I caution you when you burn down because when you burn down, you're opening up your lawn. You're opening up the sun to burn in there to areas deeper than it normally should. You're also killing off all the microbes and a lot of the soil organisms that are there that may keep things in balance and in check. And as John Perry has taught us that when you get certain problem weeds in the lawn, it's telling you there's a problem in the soil typically. So that's one of the reasons I don't like the burn downs. And then, of course, when you do do your seeding, now I recommend two sources of grass seed that I know have clean seed, clean seed, certified seed, blue tag, gold tag, red tag, white tag, orange tag, black tag, silver tag, gold tag, bronze tag. They got all the tags. And that's going to be my friend Pete from GCI Turf Academy or GCI Turf Services. If you go to his, just just Google search GCI Turf. He sells turf type tall fescue, and it's the same blend that he's got at his house. He sells good seed, 100%, no doubt about that. I've seen tons of our people use his seed, and it has come off beautifully. It's high quality if you need some fescue. The other people I recommend are Seed Superstore, Drew over there. I've met Drew twice now or or had meetings with him. And just to listen to the way he talks, how he flies out to Oregon to source the seed, he makes his own inroads. He's been in the seed business for years. He makes uh, relationships with the seed growers. He's got warehouses out there. He's got places in New York. He gets all these different, makes sure these tags are like preserved. I guess there's some way that the tags stay preserved And he has to pay extra for that, but he makes sure that his gold tags and all that and sod quality, I don't know all that stuff, but Drew, I mean, I I should know that because Drew's educated me on it. The idea is I know his seat is good. Other than that, I don't know. I don't know what you guys are getting when you're going somewhere and you're getting landscapers mix or somebody else's mix or, you know, this is my Aunt Jane's seed mix that she's been growing in her backyard since 1970, award-winning mix. I just don't know what all that stuff is and what else you could 
possibly be bringing in. And it's not people doing something on purpose. I just don't know about everyone's uh, ability to keep these crops pure. I just don't know that. So that's another reason why I recommend against all this burn down and bringing in seed. Now, if you're bringing in seed from my guys, if you're doing aeration and overseeding, not a burn down. And again, I don't get paid by Pete. Pete does not pay me for his seed and Seed Superstore does not pay me for my seed. There's a lot of things I make money on, a lot of things I sell, but it in those things. Because I said a long time ago to myself that I didn't want to make money on grass seed because of this very issue. It's one of those hard things to explain to people. It's an easy thing to blame when you have problems is your grass seed. So if you are doing that aeration overseed, realize you are keeping your turf grass there. This is another reason why I tell you to hit it hard all year and thicken it up and get it growing and get it going and get everything teamed up. That also gets the microbes kicked up. It gets the earthworms kicked up. It gets all the other soil fungi kicked up kicked up, everything kicked up, going, 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 right? And then when you put that seed in there, yes, you're aerating, but aerating is only going down three inches. And most of you, when you pull cores, aren't even pulling three inch cores. You think it's three inches, but you need to go in and double check what three inches really looks like. But either way, that's as far out as you go. And that's where the roots are at anyway. That's not going to hurt anything. You're throwing down the good seed from my guys and you're fine. You're not burning anything down. You're actually enhancing it. That's okay, and I don't think that's one of the cases here to this supposed outbreak of a lot of Poa trivialis or other problem grasses that people are seeing. So there you go. Again, we got. Man, I think I might be creating a lot of controversy in today's podcast. So if this is the last one, I hope that you guys enjoy it. We shall see. Uh, and again, then again, I might have been standing in this hot garage too long, and I'm just not thinking cr- clearly. And maybe some of you guys are eating this up and saying, "Yeah, I 100% follow you." So with that, let's go to a few recordings now. And then we're going to get through this one because I feel like it's been pretty long, but I think a lot of you like that. So the first one we're going to go to with our recordings is over to our friends in Long Island, New York. By the way, I get a lot of calls from Long Island, so that has got to be a really, really Long Island from what I can tell. If you do want to call in and you want to be featured with one of your questions here, I can't get to all of them, but I do get to the ones that tend to overlap and answer the most for the most people. Give us a call at 833-LCN-TIPS. That's 833-LCN-TIPS, 833-LCN-TIPS tips. Hey, Alan. How you doing? My name is Nick. I live on Long Island in New York. Um, I am a second year homeowner, so the lawn is still fairly new to me, but I have a question. I know that my lawn is predominantly uh, fescue with a mix of uh, perennial ryegrass that I threw down myself last year, and I started this year with a half app of prodiamine. I then used the RGS and some aerate, and I'm noticing some nice green up. However, there are some bare spots. The bare spots are ranging from, you know, two to three inches in diameter to some larger ones, perhaps six to eight. My question to you is, would I be able to hand till these areas, uh, break up that prodiamine barrier, overseed, and then put some tenacity? Or do you think I should wait until the three-month window for that three pounds per thousand that I put down to prodiamine is over, and I would have to put down that next batch of prodiamine to overseed then? Uh, just your thoughts. Um, I guess I would ask if your if you would suggest I rehit those areas with the next products again as I overseed if I go that route, or should I just leave well enough alone and hope for the best? Thanks, Alan. Take care. Okay, Nick. So first thing, as I always say, you're thinking through the strategy, and this is exactly what I want you to do. So here's the deal, and this is the deal breaker for me. You've already put your prodiamine down, so you've already started through the process. Now you've already said, okay. I'm good. I'm going to hit that 55. You've already been there. You put the prodiamine down. You watered it in. You've already started through the process. Because of that, I'm going to say I want you to stick with the, with the plan. Don't deviate. If you deviate, you're never going to really know what happened. You're not going to learn. And that's what you want to do here in this year that, that I'm with you. You're a second-year homeowner here, but still fairly new. So we'll call this your first year. This is the first year you, it seems like you're taking action. So I'm going to, t- I'm going to ask you to trust the process. You got that prodiamine down. Now, let's talk about the bare spots that you have. Some are two, three inches. Those are going to be fine. Go by our 30% rule. If you see 30% turf there, you're going to be fine. Feed it hard. Mow hard. Like I say, mow every Wednesday. Mow on Saturday or Sunday. Get that every three-day mow in there, and that's going to thicken up on its own. I know you have turf-type tall fescue and ryegrass, and those don't spread by rhizomes like bluegrass does, but they will get fat. I promise you they'll get fat, especially turf-type tall fescue. It gets fat. So that's the first thing. Now, the areas that are six to eight inches, well, you know, I think now we, we, we need to stick with the process. Again, like I said, I, I don't want you to go trying to dig anything out, put any tenacity in there. I just wouldn't worry about that. I think that it's best 
to just move forward and just feed it hard and learn. Now, take pictures of it. That's definitely something I want to stress to you. Take pictures now. Take pictures next month. Take pictures the month after. Obviously, we want to keep lawn journals, but you should keep visuals because one of the things that can happen, too, is you're looking at something every day and it doesn't look like it's changing because grass does grow slow. I think the only thing slower is watching paint dry. Even watching paint dry might be faster than watching grass grow. Unless you're on my program, then for sure your grass grows faster than watching paint dry. But either way, it still can seem slow, especially in a fast-paced world. So I'd recommend you take pictures because that will help you as you move forward. It will help you to have confidence that you are making some good progress there. So the rest of the question was about putting RGS on the seed and all that. We're not doing that. I'm hoping that you will not seed there, Nick, and that you will go ahead with my advice and just go ahead and trust the process and stick with it so we don't need to talk through the rest of that, and I hope that answers your question. Okay, now our next one, we're not going far away. We're just going over to central New Jersey, and this is from Matt. Hey, Alan. My name's Matt from Central New Jersey. I'm following your cool season plan, which I started last fall. In the summer, half of my yard was overrun with crabgrass, and after I treated it, I was left with some um, patches and bare spots. So I plan to put pre uh, pre emergent down and split applications as recommended in your guide. I also had a good amount of winter annual annuals like annual bluegrass and hairy bittercress, so I'll likely get some more prodiomy down this fall. But in your opinion, is it more important to put pre-emergent down in the fall uh, or should I aerate and overseed to help thicken things up? Thanks. Matt, this is a great question too. Same kind of thing. He's thinking through his strategy. This is exactly what I want. And you're thinking ahead, Matt. This is really smart, man. You're thinking way ahead and I like that. So I would say this is another one of those type of things, just like I told Nick previously, is to go take some pictures. If you're fighting Harry Bittercrest right now, which I don't like fighting Harry Bittercrest, it's terrible which is a winter annual, or you also said you might be fighting some poa annua. It's going to die off soon. Both of those are going to die off soon. But I want you to take pictures of what you see now because you want to remember the pain, however bad this pain is. By the way, you can also help control both of those a lot quicker in the spring by mowing them down. Even if the grass isn't growing, mow the weeds down. Mow them down. I'm telling you, every time you cut them down, it's going to hurt them. Because they're annuals, they don't have a lot stored up. So the more you cut them, the more you zap their energy out, and you can get rid of them a lot quicker. That's for all of you guys that have any kind of spring weeds that are coming in that are growing faster than your lawn, you need to mow more and you're going to zap them of energy. And that's going to be one way that you're going to help control them. But here for you, Matt, I would say definitely take pictures so you can remember that pain and then feed that lawn as hard as you can. In fact, that would be what I would do is I would feed it hard. I'd make sure my irrigation is set up good. So if we have a tough summer, it won't go dormant and I can keep it from dormancy and I can keep it growing healthy. I'd lean it out in the summer with some micros, but definitely keep it moving. And that way, when you get to fall, you can make that judgment call that maybe you don't have to seed. Because the one thing that we don't talk about um, quite often here is, is that if you don't aerate and overseed in the fall, you can keep pushing your lawn with furt and it will continue to thicken up. Now, when you do the aeration and overseeding, you are still pushing it for furt. So it does thicken up the good grass that's there along with the seed that you put down. And that's part of that fall aeration process. That's also why so many of us are successful with that is because of that exact reason is because there's grass there that's also thickening up from the hardcore push that you're giving it with that fertilizer. The seed just kind of fills in the thin spots, right? So if you can push yours hard enough here, Matt, that it's thick enough in the fall and they just keep on going, it's almost like you get to the end of the race and you decide, you know what, I'm not going to slow up here and refuel. I'm just going to put the pedal to the metal and put it down and keep going. That's what I would say you do is you make that judgment call coming into the end of August. Hey, as my soil temperatures are about to fall down to that 70, hey, I'm going to make this judgment call. I'm going to keep pushing this bad boy. I'm going to keep pushing it, knowing that grass roots expand the most in fall. And that's when you can hammer it with some air eight, get those grass roots flowing down there deep, keep the RGS flowing, humic 12, the whole thing. So that's what I recommend you do is just look forward to making that particular call in the fall. And then if you are at a tie, if you're at an impasse and you're like, man, I don't know, you know, I could definitely stand to aerate and seed here. Then go back to those hairy bitter crest pictures and, and take a look at those and see how much that pain revives for you. And then maybe you will want to consider doing a pre-emergent there in the fall and forego that seeding. And there's nothing wrong with that. Remember, we don't have to correct all those problems in a year, but it looks like you're already looking ahead. And I really appreciate that. And I think that's a really smart move, my friend. All right. So we're staying up in the Northeast. Our next one comes straight out of Massachusetts. Hey, Alan. My name is Mark. I'm from Bellingham, Massachusetts. My question is, my front yard is about 3,000 square feet, primarily uh, tall fescue. And I really dominated last year thanks to all of your help in the cool season guide. It's, been, uh, it's definitely done wonders for me. I have two small sections of my lawn that are a definite struggle. 
The first section is in front of the house, right in front of sort of my mulch and shrubs is a section. It's probably about two feet by 15 feet, so a small section, but it gets literally uh, all shade pretty much all day long. So there's you know kind of bare spots and some moss, and it just doesn't look all that great. The second section is just along the walkway. It does slope upwards and downwards. So uh, during the wintertime, we definitely add some rock salt to it. And I've been trying to be, I was trying to be a little bit more diligent this year and shoveling the rock salt and snow in the other direction. But my question is for that side, it's brown. And I know we're still in the early stages of spring where the grass is starting to come up. But most of my entire front lawn is nice and green already, but this section. So I'm thinking, and my question is, and tr- love to get your thoughts is, is this from the rock salt or is it, could it be from where my kids run around you know, did they break the crowns on the frozen grass? So my question is, you know, what, what should I do here? Uh, should I just give it time and see what happens and do something in the fall? Again, it is just a, a brown strip and it is kind of an eyesore. I did put my prodiamine down already. So if I were to do some seeding, I would definitely have to do some aeration and raking and break that barrier. I appreciate everything you do. Love your content and talk to you soon. Thanks. Okay, these are always fun for me because I like to try to get you guys to think uh, at things a little bit differently. So the first thing is with Mark here where we're talking about that he's using some rock salt and it could be affecting the grass. So the first thing I'm going to do is recommend to you, Mark, is that you switch to calcium chloride products. You're actually going to get those to melt faster and they will actually melt lower at lower temperatures than does rock salt. Might have to pay a little bit more. In fact, I think you have to pay a lot more, but it seems like it's only on a little sidewalk here. It's in one little spot. If you switch to calcium chloride, that's going to have less stress on the grass. It's much less likely to burn your grass than is rock salt. So even though you were doing your best to sweep it over one way, I think if you get calcium chloride and still stick to that same type of a strategy, I think that'll work for you and that'll help you out. Secondly, there's the foot traffic. So we're going to, we got to talk about when it comes to grasses, what are the things that we can eliminate that are natural enemies to the grass, right? So the first thing we're going to eliminate is the rock salt. The rock salt is definitely a natural enemy to the grass because it's literally burning it out. It's jacking up the soil and all that. And we all, and we know that. So we've eliminated that by going to calcium chloride. Now, can we eliminate the kids? Well, maybe when they grow up and they go off to college, you can send them to out of state school and eliminate them that way. But for right now, you can't do that. And it's really hard to train kids not to walk on the lawn, especially when it's a sidewalk and there's snow and all kinds of things going on. I get it. You can't stop that. So what I would say is, Your first choice is you eliminated one problem. We can hope for the best on the second, but definitely the kids walking on top of the snow and the ice on top of the lawn in the winter is not good for it. So I would say that the combination of those two things is definitely what's killing it. Is it one more than the other? We don't know, but you have an opportunity here because you also have a space you set on the other side, and I'm assuming these are close together, that's all shade and moss. So I think what you have here is an opportunity then to maybe make a change altogether. Maybe you just decide that that section along the sidewalk, you go ahead and bump that out and you put mulch and rock in there and you make a nice long two foot by 15 by foot bed that kind of outlines your sidewalk there. Put rock in there or whatever your chosen landscape covering is. Um, But maybe you end up doing tulips in there. Maybe you plant a thousand tulips in there and then the spring next year, the tulips come up and they line your sidewalk and they look beautiful. And I can tell you that kids won't walk on those tulips. If they walk on them during the winter, it won't hurt them or at least not, you know, it's not going to hurt them because they're underground. But if they, you know, if they're coming up in the spring, that'll keep them off. It's kind of a pretty thing, kind of a way to think about it that way. That's something I would do. Now, if you do want to go the route where you're not going to be able to create beds there, by the way, that area that's super shaded and all that, that's the same as everything. The grass is just not going to grow in the shade. So if it hasn't grown there now, assuming however long you lived in your house, it's not going to grow. Even if you were sodded or put seed in there, there is no dense grass, grass seed. So that probably may have to become a mulch bed or a rock bed or something to do with flowers or hostas or whatever else will live in the shade there. But for that area along the sidewalk, again, if you decide not to make that into a bed like I was talking about, then I think your best option there is definitely not seed. Your best option is to just go in, sod cut it out of there, flush it with water and drop some sod all the way down. Just drop it right down there and just sod it in. That's your best bet there. 
In that process, that will take out any prodiamine that's there, so you don't have to have any issue like that. You don't have to reapply anything else, but that's what I would do is just resod the area quickly. I don't think seed is a good idea. I think there's too many other problems that you're going to have there, especially that it is along a sidewalk or along an edge. That is a prime spot for crabgrass, so throwing seed in there now, you know, you'd have to, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of problem in any prodiamine that's there that could be left over. There's just a lot of things there that are going against you seeding. Hey, what's up, y'all? Well, this is Alan coming to you later on from the editing studio. Right about the time that I was answering this question, I had a technical difficulty show up on the uh, desktop of my computer, and so I feel like I didn't go back and finally finish answering Mark's question here. So just to reiterate and summarize, he's got two challenges here. He's got one area that's full shade, and it's kind of up along his house, and he's got moss there and everything else. That's not the area by the sidewalk. That's a separate area. So that shaded area over there that's not in front of the sidewalk, I would just expand the beds over there. So you already have landscape beds now, just expand them out. That's where the grass is seeking its own level. It's basically telling you where it will grow and where it will not. So just use that natural demarcation line that the grass has already told you where it's comfortable and where it's not, and go ahead and expand your bed. Along the sidewalk there, definitely just get in there, scrape all that stuff out of there. You can do, use a shovel if you want, you don't have to rent a sod cutter and just resod it this year and then go with the calcium chloride next year and hope for the best. You may end up having to deal with a little bit of crabgrass breakthrough along that sidewalk later this year, but I can tell you it will be much less if you put sod in rather than if you try to seed it. That is for sure. And with that, let's go out to our final question of the week. All right, we got one more now. We're going to go actually all the way out to Southern California. We're going out to the 909. I used to live right in between Moreno Valley and Riverside when I was stationed at March Air Force Base. That's currently been realigned now. I think it's a guard base now, but we used to have KC-10 refuelers out there. I was a part of the 722nd Air Refueling Wing, March Air Force Base, California. Shout out to Moreno Valley, Riverside area out there. Beautiful area. I love Southern California. Now, I know the 909 is a little bit bigger than that, so I'm not sure where Efren lives, but he is on the 833 LCN Tips line. Here we go, Efren. You got the final question of the day. Hey, Alan. How you doing? My name is Efren, and I live in Southern California. I type fescue grass, but my question for you is I'm getting a lot of mosquitoes lately, and what I mean is just they're just, I guess, just kind of uh, sitting on top, or I don't know if it's just just because the moisture i have been uh getting a lot of brown spots on my grass so i've been watering it a little bit more heavily trying to get that about inch and a half of uh, water a week I had to adjust my sprinkler timing to water it more but now that i have been watering it more i've been getting uh, uh less brown spots but i've been getting more mosquitoes i just want to know your opinion and see what you could help me out on that and um see what i could do thank you so much love your podcast listen all the time as I always say, Efren, great question. I like this one because we're going to think through some things. So this is an interesting one because I used to have problems with mosquitoes in my lawn in Northwest Indiana because my turf type tall fescue was so tall and so thick, they would breed in there. And, and even from morning dew, I felt like they were breeding in there because even at times of the year when I wasn't doing any watering, when it was just morning dew or whatever rain we were getting every couple days, I would definitely have mosquito problems in my lawn. I mean bad. Like you could not go outside. Even during the day, they would get you. And so a couple things that I learned there was number one, I would start mowing a little lower. I always recommend that you guys mow your turf type tall fescue at the top setting four inches or more. However, one way to control, and I'm going to give you a chemical uh, so solution here in a second, but I always want to try to give you a solution if I can that is non-chemical. And one thing you can do is mow your lawn a little bit lower. Now, I don't want you to go crazy with that effort and take it down slow, but maybe try to get it down to three inches. Turf type tall fescue will do fine at three inches. It might take a little bit more care. And on the hottest days and in the hottest parts of the summer, especially in Southern California, you may have to raise it back up or you may have to just let it go dormant, which you might be doing anyway. I'm not sure because I remember in SoCal, we would get days up over 100 degrees, but it's a dry heat, they say. I actually enjoyed it. But either way, you may have to just let it go dormant in the summer, but I would try to go ahead and try to see if you could mow a little bit lower, and that's going to create some airflow that will help dry some of that water out of there a little bit quicker. That might reduce the problem some. If you do want a chemical control, though, that I would definitely say works, it's available everywhere. It's the Cutter Backyard Bug Control. The It comes in like a hose-in sprayer, and the active ingredient, and I'm not good at saying these, is Lambda Cyhalothrin. Lambda Cyhalothrin. That's the active ingredient. 
And I have used that. I used to use it in Northwest Indiana. You can get it at Walmart, Target, of course, all the big box stores. Ace will have it. It's everywhere. I'm assuming it's in California, but it works great. Just get out there and hose it down. It's going to last you a couple of months, actually. So that works really well. It's also going to take care of other nuisance pests. And again, they're not a sponsor or anything like that. I'm telling you, this is an easy to get cheap product that works. It's going to take care of other nuisance pests, you know, fleas, ticks, ants, all those kind of things. So it's going to work for a little bit more than that. Read the label. You may be able to find some other uses for it, but Efren, that's what's going to help you to knock down those mosquitoes in your lawn. And again, that's not a product that you're going to have to spray often, maybe a couple times a year at most, because each application lasts up to three months. So I think you'll be pretty good there in most cases. So with that, guys, that's where I'm going to end it today. I really hope that the podcast has been helpful to you. I hope that you've gotten something out of this. I hope that you are thinking through your lawn care strategy and that this lawn care theory, thanks, guys, I like that, and that this lawn care theory is helping you down the road to success. So with that, I'm Alan Hain, the Lawn Care Nut. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the lawn. <laughs>